Mark, you've got the, I know the, um, a lot of different things that you've done and been involved in. So um, I'm excited to learn about them. And so I'll just turn it over to you to tell us more about yourself and, and some of the cool stuff that you've been doing. I'm not sure how cool it is, but thank you. Um, I'm on these calls pretty much all day, every day, but there's something a little intimidating about not knowing, not being able to see who all you're talking to. Uh, I've been having some internet issues, wouldn't you know it? I got the cable guy out today and they assure me that everything is fixed, but we had a little, I had a little glitch just now. So if I freeze up a couple of times, let me know and I'll switch over to another, another network. So I wasn't really sure how I wanted to organize this. I've got two of these to do this month and thought maybe I could kill two birds with one stone and, uh, that didn't really work out. And ultimately I decided that I would kind of um, organize it around uh, the cons of press, a little publishing company that I've been involved with for a long time and, and uh, look at some of the images related to different publications. Um, it's, uh, you talk about yourself enough, you develop kind of a, you know, a, a legend or whatever. And I realized when I was trying to build a little timeline for this, that mine doesn't necessarily add up uh some of the things i've been accepting about my own history as as uh, truth might might be off a little bit i'm going to share my screen well before i will i say so it starts out it's 1979 i'm a senior in high school and my dad's mom passes away and my granddad's going to come stay with us and we're going to Oh, well, uh, it looks like that tech issue that Mark referenced. Oh, here we go. Okay. We, it looks like we got you back, Mark. You froze for a minute. You were just starting to talk about 1979. Yeah. Okay. So I've switched. Oh, okay. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, you froze up again for a sec, but. Well, I switched over to 5G and let's see how that goes. Yeah, okay, sounds good. We'll just give him a, oh. Better, back. Um, um, well, we got I, you I, back. I, yeah, I apologize. My backup network's not working that great either. So let's see how it goes. Okay, so um, it's 1979. Um, um, and my dad's mother passes away and my granddad's gonna come stay with us. And we're gonna go out to Alma where he grew up and visit the Flint Hills. And, you know, the Flint Hills, I knew they were there and we'd driven out and about. And my grandparents had a little cabin on the edge, my other grandparents. And, but I, I wasn't really tuned in to them like I uh, would become. Uh, but I was excited about uh, making that outing and, and looking forward to it. And it never happened because, uh, uh, we lost him shortly thereafter. So uh, I leave the next year and I head to Lawrence to go to school. And, you know, it takes a year to settle in. And then I realize that if anybody who knows me knows that I enjoy a certain amount of time to myself, if, if, and I'm living in a, I'm in a group housing situation in Lawrence and in design studios with lots of people, and I need um, a way to get away. And I decide that I'm, I borrow this camera. Uh, from my good friend, David Ulig, who I hope is not watching because you know, I was hoping he'd forgotten that I still have it 35 years later. And uh, I took out to kind of do some of this discovery on my own. I took the camera really just so I could take some pictures to share back with my folks. So uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here. We'll go here and then I should be able to, you see a slide with my name on it? Yep, looks good. Okay, so here's just this timeline I put together. So on the red line is my interest in photography and the green line is my interest in the Flint Hills. And, you know, the, both of them were uh, not a thing at all in the early 1980s. But over time, they 
they began to come together. I, I became interested, more interested in the Flint Hills and more interested in my history in the Flint Hills and interested in uh, using photography as a, as a means for communicating, um, you know, some of my thoughts and feelings about the area. But, but th there's a larger part about Kansas too. So what happens is now, now skip fast forward, it's, it's 1998, I've, I'm out of school. I went to work for two best friends uh, one of them was from Newton, Bo Jones, a railer through and through. I worked for these guys for 11 or 12 years. I ran the creative side of an apparel business, um, essentially. And Bo left, and then I left, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I took on a design class at KU to teach, and one of my students had a really great project uses this thing with corrugated cardboard and I kind of got an idea and I kind of wanted to maybe try to be in some sort of business and I talked to Bo about it and he says okay I'll put up some money and um, the Kanza Press was born so I uh, stopped backing up a minute just to everybody kind of thinks did I name it after the Kanza Prairie and no I mean Kanza is one of the many spellings and pronunciations I named it after the the same uh, folks that the state's named after. Uh, and this was our product. It was, uh, I, I just really kind of chose note cards, I think, because I had some pictures. I just needed a product to sell. I was kind of in love with the idea of the package. And we put these box sets together and started selling them. I hired two sales reps. Those were the boom days of retail in Kansas. I had Jerry Gorman working out in the western part of the state, and I had David Earhart out of Lawrence working in the eastern part of the state. And I was going out with with a box of cards under my arm and knocking on doors and opening accounts, and you know it's kind of fun. And we were, I thought we were I would show up at the post office with a basically a truck full of boxes, and I was pretty excited. Uh, you, we learned pretty quickly that you know Kansas is a pretty small marketplace, and there's not a whole lot of margin and and note cards. Um, ultimately, my partner, uh, it just wasn't, it was, he was spending a lot of time on it, and not really seeing this explosive growth, I think he had hoped we might have. And our, our goals for the company were different. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And my parents, who I know are on the call today, kind of stepped up and said, my dad had retired and said, your mom and I might be interested in, in buying Bo's share. And, and they did. And uh, that was an awesome thing for a lot of different reasons. I don't know that the company today is at all what any of us imagined it would be. It's really, it says my connection's unstable again. Seem, I seem to be back. Um, but above all else, it's just been an opportunity to do something with my parents over a lot of years, something together as an adult and a reason to talk to each other every day. And I, I wouldn't trade that part of it for anything. Uh, when dad took over the, the bank account, I said, how much money do we have in the bank? And he said, why? And I said, well, I want to do a book. And he said, well, it better be a really small book. And uh, th this, this was born. It's about the size of a CD case. And I'd be surprised if you haven't seen one of them. Um, this has been in print except for uh, two years off here because of COVID. Uh, it's been continually in print since 2005 in one edition or another, and uh, I'm really proud of that. I think it's, uh, it's certainly the best-selling book of its kind in, in, in history, and it's, it was almost a joke. And uh, it's become an ambassador for Kansas. I just wanted to dispel the myth about, you know, Kansas being boring, being a flyover state, pass-through state on your way to Colorado. And I love that this little book has been all over the world and people buy them from me 12 at a time, you know, to put in their suitcase, to take on trips. Uh, I've had, I think they've, I've certainly been on every continent and, uh, and, and I just, I just, every, it seems like every other day I hear of another place where they showed up. Um, so what I was going to do here now is just uh, share some images from this book that that I contributed to it. So this is, a, this is a collaboration with my friend, Edward Robinson. Edward approached me pretty much in the street one day and said, you're the guy producing those greeting cards, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, you need better photographs. And he was right at the time. I was just learning. And yeah, he was just learning. He was a little ahead of me. And uh, we, we went together on this and I'm 
thrilled that we did and we've collaborated on a bunch of stuff since and we've been really close friends I just talked to him this afternoon um so Helanthius Annis this is taken in Sherman County right on the Colorado line so what I need what I need to throw in there is I, at this time I was working in Denver so I was going back and forth I was living here and had one big client in Denver and it created a lot of opportunity for me to to take pictures out west and I was always it was always a challenge to try to be in the right place at the right time you know so always trying to figure out if I leave now where will I be when the light gets right or this or that and and sometimes and I'll show you another image I wound up you know loitering or speeding or one thing or another to try to make something come together before I lost the opportunity this is uh I really I was really uh, mad at myself when I, this is a film camera, large format film camera, medium format. And when I got the trannies or transparencies back, uh, I'm like, what was I thinking? Ugh, why did I shoot these backwards, you know? And then I began to see almost these plants take on almost kind of a human quality. And I've, I've come to, to, love that I shot it backwards. And I think that's why it's been a really popular image for me. It's probably, it is without a doubt, the most sold image in my portfolio. It's also my oldest, one of my oldest commercial images. And I don't, I think those two facts are only kind of loosely related to one another. Um, this is another early image. Um, I can't remember, Rollins County maybe. Um, taken um, during that same era, another real popular image. This is one of my personal absolute favorites. This is pieced together out of five images. Uh, you, you know, the first digital cameras came out, the, the uh, sensors were relatively small. So all of us who were trying to make prints that we could do something with were, were getting into panoramas because we could combine files to make something larger. And hand stitching them, I, I put this together you know, without any software. Uh, that's the little tiny town of Levant. You can see the elevator and a couple of lights in the background. And I just love how the weather and the landscape dwarfs that community. And looking up the exact location to make a note in some publication or something a few years ago, I realized that this place where I pull over, and I've pulled over there a bunch of different times, uh, was the scene of a really grisly murder uh, high, Kansas Highway Patrol car chase that ended there in in death. So you can look that up sometime. So this is turning 180 degrees, same day, same time, just turning around. And I, I joke a lot, and anybody who's heard me talk is it says unstable again. So still hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, it um, a joke that I can't. You know, I stand in the shower every morning trying to remember if I've shampooed my hair. Uh, but somehow I can remember pretty much everything about making every one of these images. I think it just involves so many of your senses. And uh, this was just a bitter, bitter cold winter day. I know it looks like the heart of thunderstorm season, but it wasn't at all. And uh, I don't know. It was just I go back and forth between these two. It was just a real humbling experience where one of those where you feel really small. Okay. This is uh, Chicken Creek Crossing, Douglas County. Uh, I remember this day really well. Edward was with me and I locked my keys in the car. <laughs> it was really cold. And I thought we were gonna have to throw a brick through the, anyway, I digress. Uh, Milo, another popular image, another one made damn near on the border. I was watching that thunderstorm build in my rear view mirror all the way across Kansas. And just hoping, you know, I could line this thing up. And in the end, this is the one where I saw the sign that said Colorado and uh, threw on the brakes and got off the road right there and started driving around looking for anything I could put in the foreground that was still in Kansas. And that's how this was born. And I just saw a picture somewhere of uh, this hanging in a conference room. I remember I had forgotten about selling it to that company and I was real pleased to see it. Homestead. Uh, is an image fraught with uh, problems from a you know a photographic standpoint. The sky's a little blown out, the composition's a little off, but it sure moves people for whatever reason. Um, it was licensed to be uh, the cover of the Great Plains Atlas, um, and it does say a lot to me about 
the high, you know, the whole high plains thing. Uh, this is uh, southwestern uh, corner of the state, and people forget, I think, that a lot of Kansas is really desert. <laughs> okay, and uh, and there's another one coming up here of this. Just remember this: the same place that looks completely different. Okay, so uh, in 2006, boy, we were that little book had been selling and we thought well, we're just going to make a fortune sell them little books. So boom, boom, two more out in a row, uh, volume two. And then I went up and, and met Mike Forsberg, who some of you have probably heard of a wonderful, um, um, uh, conservation photographer out of Nebraska. And he's about my age and he was at about the same place in his career, really enjoyed meeting him, really enjoyed doing the book with him and had hoped to build, uh, a business in Nebraska realized that I should have done a little, I mean, Nebraska, you think Nebraska makes Kansas look big and it didn't turn out to be the marketplace. I hope it would be ultimately, uh, um, we sold these for many years and walked away from Nebraska. So the Kansas landscape volume two, I don't know, we should have stuck with volume one, but it, it still did. All right. This is, um, uh, uh what's the name of it saunders mound uh at clinton lake and this is pieced together i think out of two or three images and you can see if you blow it up on it and i'm afraid to a couple sitting on that bench that's on the top of that trail and i'm pointing to it with my fingers if you can see um okay this is back out in that same part of Western Kansas in one of the rare, 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 rare years where they get the right amount of water at the right amount of time. And I was with my folks and we were driving back from, or maybe I was just with my sister, but in one way or another, we're driving back from New Mexico. And I saw this, and I had to stop and spend time. And I, I thought I'm going back. And I went back the next week or I called somebody to check on it about going back the next week and it was gone. And I've never seen it. I haven't seen it that colorful out there before or since. This is an uh, uh, interesting, dad knows exactly where this is. It's, it's on the uh, Rooks County line. What is that, Ellis Rooks County line? And it's just a, it's just a road that I always in heaven that's going up toward where my dad's mom was born and raised. And I just think it's interesting that a county road in Kansas kind of does this little S turn up and over a little mountain. You know, it's not what people expect. Um, Another one out west, I don't remember the exact spot, probably near Colby. Uh, I always just thought it looked, you know, just kind of a classic summer evening, say goodnight, folks, shot. Um, it's giving me the unstable again. This is uh, Douglas County, uh, hen, hen bit. Um, I don't know, just a storybook, kind of classic image. Not one of my favorites, but but a, but people really responded to it in a positive way. Okay, then the next project up, I told you we were all into shooting panoramas and I had a few that I really liked and Edward had a few that he really liked. And um, we decided, well, that's really funny. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, Nancy Kassebaum did the forward on landscape too. And that was my first, uh, opportunity to meet and talk with Nancy. And uh, I would say we're still friends. We're not close, but I could call her and she'd know who I am. And I really enjoyed that, that opportunity. I remember calling her to ask her something and Howard Baker, who at the time was probably one of the third most powerful men in the world, would answer the phone and talk to me like I was his, you know, long lost buddy. And I thought that was pretty neat. So Marcy Pinner, who a lot of you know, I'm sure, uh, graciously wrote the forward for this. And I, we, there are some great images in this book and there are some images that are just okay, but it stayed in print for quite a long time. And I could probably bring it back today and do okay with it. This is Lane County, probably a more classic sunflower. I can't remember what I call this, uh, Sunflower Road. I just like the way it all came together. Again, this is, all, this is seven or eight different panels that are kind of hand stitched together. This is Douglas County, um, Ice Storm. That barn is gone now. Um, this is a, if I do say so myself, a really beautiful print on paper. 
at, at size at 30 or 40 inches. And, and when we briefly had a gallery, I shared a gallery with Louis Copt and Lawrence and, and uh, for whatever reason, maybe the Douglas County tie, but, but this was a, a favorite there. Flint Hills from probably my favorite spot. If I told, <laughs> when we get to the Flint Hills part, if I showed you how many were from more or less this spot, it would be embarrassing for me. Okay, so then the next project we did was, uh, this is during the time when I was doing the gallery with Louis, and I just thought that it would be a good idea to do, to do something with, that wasn't photography. Um, we, did a, we did okay with the title. It, it, it wasn't a, a barn buster, but that's more on me than it was on Louis because all the work in here is absolutely beautiful. I've skipped that because there's none of my stuff in here. So now it's 2011 and those two lines on my graph or my timeline that I showed you originally have kind of converged and I have really become involved in the Flint Hills and and uh, I'm interested in my history in the Flint Hills. I'm interested in being involved. I've met Jim Hoy and the, all the Hoys and I've, um, you know, I, I'm beginning to want to have a voice about this part of the world. Um, this book was produced, it's been reprinted twice. Uh, we're in the th second or third edition. It's, um, will be in print. I hope for some time to come. It's been a really good product for us. And I was a little nervous about doing something that was just a part of the state, right? Uh, maybe I was kind of, uh, carving up my audience too much, but it's, it's, uh, the, the reception is, is, uh, heartwarming. Um, I, this is a quote from the book. It was really kind of my realizing that, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to be a national geographic photographer and travel the world. You know, maybe there's something important to do right here. And at the time, you know, there are a lot of fantastic photographers working in the Flint Hills right now. And I'd like uh, some, a bunch of them I met through workshops with Edward and, uh, Ed, I did one with, or I, I went to a couple of his as a, kind of a helper glorified um, junior partner. And then we did a couple together and mostly the people who came were just folks, people like me who needed access. They, they didn't really need to gain photo skills. But they needed access, which we sorely lack in the state. We have a lot of private land, which, you know, it's not a bad thing. Anyway, um, I'm sure I'm making the assumption that everybody on the call is kind of familiar with, with the, with the area, but if not, uh, I will give you some resources, don't worry about it. So a little bit about my history. This is my great, great, great grandparents are standing to the left of the gate. So my great, great grandmother's in there and um, the house still stands. Um, they came to Wapunsee County pre-statehood. And this is just on the other side of Alma. Uh, and in this is my grandfather, the one who did not make the trip. He's the baby in the picture. So this is my grandfather and my great grandparents and my great, great grandparents. And, you know, I began to have this real sense of belonging somewhere that kind of caught me off guard. I'd be poking around out there on ground that had, you know, kind of been in the family for a long time and uh, just felt really oddly at home. This is, uh, these are images from that book now. So this is um, Fall in the Flint Hills One. You know, you get tired of naming images. Uh, th the weird thing about this is I had this in the gallery and a, a big copy of it and it's in Greenwood County. And I took it on a day, I was with my folks and um, I remember the day well, we were look, going out to look at a little piece of property and uh, a lady walked in and she says, I know exactly where that was taken. She was all excited. And I hear this all the time. And I've learned to just kind of nod and smile and say, yes, <laughs> maybe you'd like to own it. Uh, but she was right to within, you know, a few feet. <laughs> she goes, you were standing here and this is, and I, I thought that was pretty cool. And the landscape can certainly make an indelible impact on people that uh, they kind of imprint. Um, another real favorite of mine, uh, Central Flint Hills, Chase County. 
uh, a rock that I joke is, you know, my most popular model. <laughs> Um, there's burning going on in the background. This has been burnt probably in the last 10 days or so. That's my favorite time of year, um, that transition. It's just so quick. But the one thing I like about Kansas and the Flint Hills, and I say, you know, Colorado has uh, two and a half seasons. And I've spent a ton of time. I love the West, right? But uh, they have summer and they have winter. They have a tiny little bit of spring and then uh, this tiny little dash of fall and we get a different season every day. I mean, I can pretty much, you can take me blindfolded into anywhere in the state, you know, and block my other senses. And I could tell you, you know, what time of year it was just by looking at the color palette and what's going on with the sky. Um, there's something new to see every time you turn around. And I think that's one of the really special things about the, the, the plains. And you'll also see that the weather plays a big role, especially in my early work, the work out west, because I think the weather is a really big part of, of the landscape. You know, the, the, the weather is definitely part of the scenery. It's not like uh, the mountains where you, you know, you, you feel uh, three-fifths of everything you see is, is ground and a little sliver of it. Uh, another central Flint Hills, very late winter. Um, I love, I like this one a lot too. I like that you can see burned ground and um, ground that will be soon. This is, this is probably March. It's probably not too far from now. You know, people were burning earlier and earlier. Now there's a lot of fall burning going on. It's hard to predict. This is what Buncee County, Snoqualmie Creek, uh, just uh, a good hay meadow and kind of a classic. Kansas scene and I it's an older image I entered it in a in a show uh this year and took a, a prize for it, which kind of pleased me and surprised me it's I just always thought it seemed real peaceful and I have one here if you're interested in it <laughs> printed on metal uh this uh is the headwater of uh Fall River up at Texaco Hill basically that's um broom weed and I had this in a gallery show and I had this old country cousin who came in there and, you know, I can't remember what I called it. I certainly didn't call it broomweed. And he goes, that's broomweed, you know? And uh, I was kind of embarrassed because I think uh, you know, it's not necessarily a great thing to have a lot of in your pasture, but I do really like the image. And a really close friend of mine just wound up buying quite a bit of ground downstream from this. And I'm really excited about getting to go out there and, spend some time this year. Um, I think I put these two in a row here. Yeah, I, I like to hang these two together and talk about these two together. And I think they're next to each other in the book. I thought a lot about pairings in the book uh, because this is essentially, you know, the same, same place, just opposite times of the year. And what a difference, you know, what a difference a few months can make. Uh, this is one of the few images of mine that I've ever that I've had hung in my own home, uh, Chert Ridge at twilight, because I've always felt like I could walk into it, that I could just walk into that scene. Um, it's just a, it's just a neat place to be. I remember taking, I had it when I was in graduate school, and I had made a lot like people from other parts of the world. I had made friends with an Italian woman, and her parents were here to see her hooding. And they were stuck with nothing to do for two days. And I said, and they didn't, didn't speak English, which is pretty rare. And uh, I asked her to ask them if they'd let me take them out to see the Flint Hills. And they said, sure. And I took them up to this hill top and got there right about sunset. And I looked back and uh, he, the husband was crying. And I, he just said, it's just, we'd seen one of everything. I couldn't have planned it better, you know, a coyote, a fox, uh, just a hawk, you know, a, a white tail, probably saw one of those rare pronghorns that's out there, just one after the other. And he said, you know, we just don't have this in Europe anymore. And uh, it was really moving for them. And I know I talked to her, this is 20 years ago now, or 15 years ago now. And she says that her folks still talk about that, that afternoon. Uh, this is looking over the flying W, the ranch house. The house is gone now. I 
uh, those of you who know Josh and Gwen know that it was lost to a fire a couple of years ago. The barn's still there. Um, don't know that I have anything else to say about it. This is uh, called Naring Branch. So Naring is the was my dad's grandmother's name. And the road is named after them. And that branch of the, of the Mill Creek is named after them. So this, I'm looking down here over ground that um, was part of the original homestead claim. And my great, great, great grandparents and several others are buried in a little cemetery in the trees down there to the right. Uh, it, this just uh, captures a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's I guess interesting to me, but I think it's all. I, I think this is a particularly kind of pretty image that was a little bit of a bit of an accident. This is uh, right at. Uh, I was on my way to the Black Hills, and somehow I wound up at the at the uh, cattle pens there at Bazaar, and this is just right off the right off that exit. I thought it was a pretty image. And this is looking up toward my cousin's place. Uh, the name of the road is on the tip of my tongue. Just uh, uh, you always know when the sumac starts to come that everything's about to flip pretty quickly. So, and uh, the story about this, everybody probably knows the schoolhouse at the Z Bar, which is now the park. I this was taken on the uh, afternoon of the last matinee performance of the Flint Hills Rodeo ever. I really miss that they don't do those Sunday afternoon things anymore. They were a lot of fun and it started to rain and everybody was getting out of there. And, and I just looked up in the rear view mirror and saw that sky. And I'm pretty shy photographer. I don't, I'm not that guy who likes to get out in front of everybody. And I did here, I threw on the brakes and pulled the tripod out and was setting everything up and it was, it was starting to rain. I just, I just had to, try to capture this kind of alignment of everything. Now, the interesting thing, Bruce Hogel and a few other people have similar images from different times. And I think there's just something, there's some sort of vortex there that does something with the clouds over that little part of the world. Uh, this is on the uh, se se seven mile loop up at Kanza, which if you don't go up there, haven't been up there, go. It's just a beautiful, public, you know, place that's open to the public and great, great place to go walk and, and, and experience the Flint Hills. So uh, I don't remember why exactly, but I asked, I uh, called Josh and Gwen Hoy and said, hey, can I just come stay down there for a week? It was in the fall and camp and make photographs. And they said, sure. And I ran into, or I was talking to Jim and Jim says, Oh, you got to go over to such and such a pasture and see this, this grass. It's really tall. And it was, and I, I wish I had the other picture. It's up to my shoulders. And he was telling me, and I've I cut some of it. It says unstable connection again. Let's see. Okay. I cut some of it and I have it out in the garage. I was always going to find a really long glass tube and frame it for them. Uh, Jim was telling me stories about how in the, you know, they're in the literature about people, being able to reach down and tie the grass over their, over their saddle. You don't see that so much more because people just don't let it go that far. This is one of my all time favorite Flint Hills images. It's that year, uh, 2012, we had really, really no winter at all. And it was really dry. It was just, everything was out of order. So you got the red buds out and the trees are blooming and nobody's even thought about burning. It was just kind of a rare, kind of combination of things and I don't know uh I I was with a group of people it was one of those workshops and I know one person in particular and she may be on the call who has a similar image who's kind of left it in the drawer and let me have this one and I appreciate that um I wasn't going to go because a friend of mine had an old friend of mine from growing up had I just learned that he had passed away he was a brilliant musician and uh, I was just kind of down and out and Edward said, Oh, come. And you know, you don't even have to bring a camera. So I'm like, all right. And I got out there and then I saw this starting to happen. I was running to get, <laughs> to get that camera. And I always, I, I call it heavenly light because I always felt like Bill kind of handed me the, handed me the shot. This is more recent in that same central area. And this is June. This is kind of a, 
it's just a weird time, late summer and people are usually, it's been hot and people are hiding indoors and not really going out. It's a really beautiful time to, to be out there. The palate takes on more of a, a softer, I'm looking at the clock, uh, a road I've, this road has appeared in a lot of photographs, but I, I just couldn't resist this one. And this, is, I think, is the last of the Flint Hills images here. This is on that uh, ground that Bill Hodge just sold, um, looking back toward the turnpike. I debated forever whether I'd leave the truck there or take it out. I would normally take that out. And I'm not opposed. I take phone poles out, too. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it provided some scale. And, you know, it is interesting how the a lot of people, all they know of the Flint Hills is the turnpike, and that's it. And I'm always blown away by, I live in Kansas City. It's, I'm, I grew up in Wichita. I live in Kansas City and have for a long time. And I'm just blown away by how many people here have live, you know, an hour away from this really uh, unique and rare endangered ecosystem and really know nothing about it at all. Symphony has changed that a little bit, but... Okay, so I had envisioned a trilogy. I wanted to do something with fire. Uh, I had, I, uh, Louis uh, Kopp, the painter, had really was one of he and, um, oh, uh, tip of my tongue, photography professor from Emporia State had both kind of been pioneers in seeing that fire as a, you know, a subject for art, artistic expression. And I kind of got on board with that too a little bit i mean i just love being out there this time of year and if you if you can make a um an interesting image while you're doing it that's just a bonus so i just can't wait till that time of year uh it means winter's over or almost over <laughs> um i think my dad who's on the call said i'm not so sure this is a great idea it's fire you know and in the end he may have been right uh, this is the one of the few books that I uh, that we have has seriously underperformed, but I still like it. One of the really unique things about it was that it had this uh, AR component. So the most of the images in the book, you could download an app and you could view the page through the app and the page would come alive. And I was going to show you one of those videos and I couldn't get it put together. Regretfully, the software, everything about it's kind of aged out. This software that was behind it, uh, we were licensing that and that company went out of business. And uh, But I still have some of those books and I still like those books. And in the end, I'm going to give you an opportunity to have one of your own for free if you want it. So um, this is not in the book, but it should be. I just, I, this, I like what this image says. It looks like a lunar landscape, you know, and it's, it's, it's that brief four day window or five day window between burn and when that those first little slivers of blades of green grass start to show i'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit this is uh does anybody know what forms this pattern i'm not gonna wait for the answer this is if you see this it means that somebody's riding usually riding around on a horse uh with a box of kitchen matches uh, tossing them out. I love, uh, this is the video I want to share because it's just the crackling and you can hear the metal arcs and you can, you can almost smell. This just gives you some idea of the scale. If you haven't been out there when there's a lot of burning going on, you know, this is miles and miles and miles of ground on fire. Okay, so the next book is The Kansas Sky. So the very first book, I didn't say, uh, the, the first little Kansas landscape book, um, I went out and got a corporate sponsor for that. So that was an interesting model, you know, that I, nobody else was really doing. And it was the Kansas Land Trust, and it was kind of a win-win for both of us. And it let, let me get the book published and let them have something to use as a, a gift and to, to uh, uh, create some awareness. And by the time we get to here some or nine years later, we're able to invert the model a little bit. And this book is a collection of photographers. I think there are 14 photographers in it. I'm just one of them. Um, the um, um, 
Um, I'm going to give credit for this photograph in a second when it comes to me. Um, we took the royalty that normally would have gone to the photographer and we uh, offered it back to uh, Marcy Pinner and her program, uh, Kansas, Sam or, uh, Kansas Sampler Foundation. So uh, a portion of every book sold goes, goes back to her. And it's not a ton of money, but it's a nice little contribution to her every year. And I'm glad we can do that. And I think she's glad to have it. It was a way I didn't know how to, I don't believe in doing books and not compensating the content creators. There are just way too many people out there taking advantage of content creators. Uh, I, but I didn't have a way to pay. There was just not enough in here to pay everybody. So I got everybody said, I'm going to do this thing and I want to support this cause. And we did it. And we're still supporting that cause. Uh, I had this winter image in there and this image I've always loved because it just looks like a, a, a some sort of time warp is about to open up and, you know, the aliens are about to take another cow or something going on here. Uh, this is Leavenworth County. Those uh, big old locust trees, that, uh, boy, they eat a lot of tires. That's all I'll say about the locust trees. Okay, so then the next two little books here, I I can't really call them books. I mean, they're, po they're postcard books. They're short on pages. It was a way for really for us to, to get some product out there during these lean times around COVID and the start of COVID. And I don't know if my timing might be off a little bit off on that, but um, they were fun to do. And they're both indicative of kind of different directions that I kind of want to go personally. Uh, this one was just just kind of general Kansas. It was me getting, you know, the uh, little book I said it was out of print for the first time. So we needed something that had, you know, that represented the whole state to get sold to our Western customers. I love this part of the country. This is out there uh, in Jewel County, I believe. You can tell as you go west here and then get the road, the chalk gets wider and wider. And then, you know, you're getting close to Hayes when that road is just chalk white. I think everybody recognizes the Castle Rock. Um, this is, uh, I started uh, flying out of Atchison and Leavenworth and spending time up in the northeast corner of the state, which I hadn't really before. And it's that, uh, it's that country, I can't remember what they call this. this. There's a name for that geography, but it's mostly formed by the river. And it's just beautiful up there. I just had no idea. And I've, 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 spent a lot of time up there lately I, I it's a really interesting place this is donovan county which is the far north east and this is west of hayes on a storm that i was i had the brakes on i was going 30 miles an hour because i just did not want to catch up to this thing and when i got to my i, I as i get older i couldn't make it all the way home from colorado after a, a full day of work which is probably embarrassing to admit, but I, as I pulled into my hotel, they were all just coming out of the tornado shelter. So I felt like I did it. I, I made the right decision hanging back and taking pictures. Okay. So um, I mentioned airplanes a few years ago. I grew up, uh, dad's been involved with airplanes and flying forever. So I've been around them my whole life and I'd had a couple false starts. And a friend of mine, bought a little modern version of the Piper Cub and renewed his license a handful of years ago. And he took me for a ride. One of my first rides, we went out to see the Flint Hills and I took this picture <laughs> hanging out of that airplane. Um, and I was like, wow, I got to do this. <laughs> so I got back into flying myself. And I think, I mean, I've just really been interested in, I'd always wanted to make aerials and, you know, the one thing that kind of irks me is now I finally have pulled this together at exactly the same time. Everybody can buy a drone for $300 and, you know, but I still sh shooting with a drone and shooting from an airplane in an airplane, you have, you can really work around to get the right shot. You know, you have the camera in your hand and uh, I think there's something to be said for that. So I've been building a, there's a growing collection of aerials of Kansas and I, I think there's probably a project in there somewhere. This is Flint Hills, um, you know, early spring. This is uh, Eastern Red Cedar. Jim is, you know, pretty passionate about the encroachment and so am I. In fact, I wanna work with him on, on that issue. Uh, 
specifically over the next few years, but this is still kind of a pretty picture. <laughs> this was that, that first, that day, and this is, they were a uh, controlled burn on the Z bar. This is the way it should look, a tree, a, the occasional tree. Uh, this book does not exist, but it, I, that, to me, that was always the third leg of that series. And, you know, I have about 90% of it. So, you know, maybe it will exist before too long. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Uh, but it was a chance to show you some of that work. I, I've, I have become, I'm not less interested in the landscape, but I have become more and more interested in the people. And the people I've met doing this have been the best part of, of, of the, you know, I wrote, I got an old friend called me and uh, asked me to work on a project for the Smithsonian, for a, a magazine for a group outside this inside the Smithsonian and I wrote that you know I don't know how this borrowed camera and a long weekend in the foothills turned into 30 year kind of journey uh, but it did and uh, and out of it I've just made this is Jim Hoy's the back of Jim Hoy's head <laughs> I've just made so many wonderful wonderful acquaintances um you know, that's not all done on horseback. In fact, not all that much these days, but it's still interesting. This is a cousin and I uh, thought it was really clever how he got his four-wheeler on and off of the, the truck. I don't know. I helped put these cows on in the spring and take them off in the fall. And I don't, this was a vet out of Hillsboro and I don't know what happened to him. This is the cousin that and he passed away in an accident a couple years ago. He was kind of in, instrumental in my learning about the, the Flint Hills. I didn't meet him until he was probably in his early 70s. This is uh, hideously uh, overexposed. I don't know what's wrong with this file, something. <laughs> okay, so where, where are we at on time? I'm looking at my... Um, well, oh, we've got just about doing just 750. So we've got we've got some time left. OK, we're doing exactly right. So uh, I'll let you know about some things that are out there. Uh, the Flint Hills Anthology .com is just where I have tried to, you know, I've got all these photographs and I want them to live beyond me in some way. And I don't know what that is, but I'm trying to build a catalog. And that's this. So you can make a screen capture or jot this down or just Google for me. And you can find it. And there's a lot of stuff there. And there are some duplicates. And there's some writing that doesn't make sense. Because, you know, I was pretty sure I was going to get this all put together in a week. And now it's years later. And I, I still don't have it all put together. Um, there's the con suppress. And um, we have, a, you know, I didn't talk about any of the cards or the other products we do. And I don't show them here. But we do. We have a full line of of greeting cards and a handful of books in print. And we offer gift prints, matted gift prints on the site. And then you, we have addition to prints on the site too. And that's the tip of the iceberg. If there's something there, if you've seen something in anywhere uh, of mine that interests you, and I'm not here to pitch at all, but just call me or email me and see if it doesn't have to be on that page to, for me to be able to get you get uh, you a print we do and we do a ton not a ton but we are lucky to have a couple uh, corporate jobs fall in our lap every year and where we'll do an office building I did a floor of the lock-in insurance building which I'm proud of because that was a big space did that with Edward um, I've done a lot of de dentist offices for some reason so there uh, I'm really proud that um, you know people that's where you have to go every day that want to put this, this, this stuff on their walls. Um, oh, so what I was going to say here, if you buy anything from the site and when you're checking out, there's a, like a PayPal checkout card, there's a place to put a note. 
And if you just write, you know, Newton, if you put the word Newton in the note, uh, I will throw in a copy of the of the uh, Prairie Fire book with a purchase of anything else. Okay, and then I wanted to just talk briefly about Emil Redmond's cow. Um, and I'm going to stop my share to do this. And I'm going to come to uh, here. And then here. I'm not sharing. I am sharing now. I'm sh okay. Yeah. So I need to go to Redmond's cow. So um, sorry, I knew that would happen. So I cleaned my desktop. See how smart I am. Okay. Now you see just pretty much this old cowboy. This is Mark, my friend, Martin Gannott and Steven Anderson. The one in the picture I said was the cousin I had. He was a great storyteller and I really wanted to get some of his stuff on film and he wanted to do it. He had one about my great grandparents that I just can't remember that I just loved. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off. In fact, I had put it off the week before he was in the accident and, and passed away. So I have been thinking about wanting to do this for a long time. And I had met a gentleman who was on the board of the Wabunsee County Historical Society. And they had it, were kind of talking about wanting to start getting some stories collected. And the two came together and I jumped in and I started going out to collect stories from old farmers and ranchers. And the reason being that I just, some of these folks, you know, Rural Electrification Act was 36 or something, but they didn't have electricity and, and running water in a lot of the Flint Hills until the fifties. So this is kind of the last, these folks in there, especially the ones in their nineties. And I have a woman I've interviewed twice, who's 102. Uh, they, um, they experienced a completely different life. They worked with horses, you know, they didn't have running water. They were sustenance farmers. It's just a completely different way of life. And I just wanted to, I wanted to collect some of these and my, my, um, what I did a little bit differently is I don't, I don't want people to just tell me their history. You know, history is easy to look up. I just want to talk. And hopefully a handful of good stories will come out of it. And uh, I didn't know which one to do. So I did one that's funny and short that I wanted to share with you tonight. This is Tony Misaki. He is a seventh generation Kansan like me. And this is a story about his uncle. Uh, the trip. Give me the thumbs up if you can hear the audio, okay. And so a bunch from Volunteer walked over from here to our place, which is about three miles, and Otto Crosser was one of them. And in 1908, there was no electricity or lights or anything, so I guess they carried lanterns, I guess. Well, Otto Crosser carried the shotgun, so he stopped up, stepped up beside the house and shot the shotgun and he was going to bring him out of the house and he got too close and he shot a hole through the soffit in our house and dad showed me that hole there a lot of times they had a patch over that soffit and i think it even went up there through the roof a little bit <laughs> so then that was in 1908 and so then he come back and courted mabel then and they used to tease him about that and he sheepishly had to always remember Admit that he shot that hole through Herman Mizuki's house, and then he come back and courted his daughter. Well, anyway, another deal with Otto Kratzer is over there with this place where William Horn's place was, and then afterwards, when this Slip Grunwald lived there, they they had a big barn, and they had dances in there. You know, old, old, old dances. Well, anyway. And this was before Otto and Mabel was married. Uh, did you ever hear of Fenamont gum? You know what Fenamont gum was? Well, it was a laxative gum. It was made for kids. Kids would always chew gum. So then instead of them taking casserole or something other, 
they'd give them that gum, you know, because I was constipated. Well, here come autocrats of that night, Dad said. He, he said, over at the store, we got in this new gum. You know, I want you to all try it out. And he passed it out. He said, oh, take a couple, they're good. Dad said it wasn't long. He said they was all running for that outhouse. He said they all got their craps. And, oh, I, I bet you Dad told me that story four or five times. And that autocrosser pulled that on them. He, he just loved to pull little tricks like that on people. And I... Huh. I didn't stop that. I don't know. Maybe I had to go back and check my edit. So this is a labor of love. I, I couldn't pick one person, one set of stories out of here over another. I love the interviews with Evelyn and Mary. They were 99 years old. They're best friends. They apologize that, well, you know, we've only known each other since like 1960. Uh, Mary did not make it to 100. Uh, Evelyn is 102. They named a day after her this year and Alma. And uh, if you scroll down on the page, I interviewed her for the Smithsonian project. She's in this. There's just a lot of good stuff here. And uh, I encourage you to look at it. Um, I really want to, this is kind of an uh, important focus for me, I think, for the next kind of chapter in my, at least my creative life anyway so that's it uh thanks for indulging me it just you know i hate doing the all about me thing but i didn't really know what else to do so that's it yeah questions or i know we're right at time right now yeah thanks we do have some time for some questions so we've had, we've had some come in and then anybody else who'd like to ask a question you can type it on the chat or the q a if you're on zoom um Let's see, we had a couple questions about the cameras and stuff that you use. Um, um, Sean asked, uh, or, well, you know, uh, she's a very neat thank you. And then he said lots of wide angle shots. And then related thing, Jim, Jim Griggs um, commented, drones are almost exclusively super wide lenses. So shooting from an airplane gives you choices in perspective. So what, what can you tell That's us about true. the different lenses? That's stuff? true. And in fact, so are the, all the action cameras are mostly exclusively wide. And I managed to buy one that's not <laughs> that I've been playing with a little bit. Uh, I've never been uh, a gear guy at all. So I, if I thought I could grab it real quick without knocking something over, I would. Uh, one of the first cameras that I was really, well, I had, you know, the one that I never returned. And then uh, I bought a fixed lens Fuji. So that was, uh, I think, 60 millimeters on 120, which is really wide. And I just, you know, that forced me, I just shot with that camera for years and figured out how to make images with it. So that was kind of my, you know, that was, that's wide. Um, and then when digital came around, we did whatever we could afford about these little brick cameras from, um, I went hook, line, and sinker di digital, and I have no, uh, no shame in that. It really, I was never very Pak Chi Lao will tell you what I was like in the dark room. I, it was a nightmare. And um, um, I uh, 5D Mark II, full, my first full frame digital uh, was a used uh, um, Canon, and I put a uh, it's probably 17 millimeter. Meaty, meaty, middle of the road quality lens. I always felt like I was didn't have a ton to spend, and uh, shot that almost exclusively for a long time. And uh, now I have an older uh, um, Sony A series A seven R three, and I shoot uh, uh, Fuji X two. Uh, is my my every my knock around camera is pretty much exclusively the Fuji X. But I'm not a big I'm just not a big, I don't think the camera makes the photographer at all. And I think there's, I have a friend who put a brilliant, beautiful book together, just using an iPhone. You know, it's really more about, I think, ha a combination of having uh, something you want to express and uh, having a vision and, and, and having some sense of composition and some of these other things. Well, really, uh, as you well know, Jim, uh, be, it's a lot about working to be at the right place at the right time. So. Yeah. And then um, uh, 
Let's, let's see, Phil, Mark, thank you for sharing your remarkable works. You're definitely gifted. Um, and then Crystal. That's my mom. <laughs> Phil, Phil Noah. And then Crystal said, love the stories. Um, where did you publish the postcard book? So I guess, is there a, a press in Kansas or somewhere around that you use? Well, to? I am. We are the Kansas Press. Right. And uh, you can, um, where do you live? Um, they're, they're sold at, we really, if you go, I'll tell you what, if you go to the website, you, you'll see the big thing. We'd like you to buy it at your local store if you can, because we really want to support our local retailer. But if you can't, you can buy them from me. And if there's a link on there and send me, and I said, if, you know, if you want to know if there's a retailer near you, use that link to get in touch with me and I'll, and I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm pretty sure I've seen them um, at um, at very you know shops. They're at Watermark. Like they used Watermark. to be at Ruzan's in Newton for a long time. Uh, uh, we're at Kaufman Museum. Um, I'll figure it out. Shoot me a line, and I'll figure out where you get it. Yeah, yeah, and then um, let me see. My my mom actually when she was those Prairie Fire photos, and I remember this too. Um, time we really wish we had a camera we were driving home from Colorado and they were doing those controlled burns and then it, it happened like there'd been super heavy hail that happened right before we drove by so it's like all these all this hail that was turning to steam with the flames going through it it was like oh the, that would be really cool side. so like man we wish you had a camera for that one oh um, that <laughs> there have been a lot of things I wish I had a camera for just curse myself i was at a, a party in wichita in the 90s uh, where they had a chuck wagon supper and some big tents and everything and the tornado sirens went off and you know how we are we just went out to see if we could get a better view and uh and i watched a barbershop quartet sing while that tornado the one that got mcconnell and then kind of not the big one, but a year later or two, got McConnell and danced across the east side of town, was in the background. If I'd had a camera for that shot at the quartet and the tornado and all the stuff going up, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be laying on some beach somewhere, uh, retired. <laughs> well, that's that's um, that's really cool. And it's um, it's neat that you've been able to, um, you know, turn turn your, uh, your passion and, and artistry into a successful business as well as pursuing projects like Emil Redmond's, is it Emil or Emil? Uh, Emil, Emil. Emil, Emil Redmond's cow and stuff like that, but I'm going to spend a lot of, some more time on that website, listening to those stories and stuff. So um, I don't, let me see if I, I don't see. I'm it. related to Emil's brother, Adolf, but I just didn't want to name it Adolf. So I named it Emil and his, his uh, grandson called me the other day, he's 80 something. He says, I kind of feel like I ought to know you. <laughs> and I said, okay, oh. I got to <laughs> tell you about this. And I did. Yeah. Oh, I did see Phil did have one other question. Did you use flash on the Milo field at Colorado? The, the photo? No, that, no, no okay. I, I don't use flash really at all. I don't good enough. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, uh, I don't even do. So anyway, no. Okay. Well, there you have I don't it. know why it's filled like that. It's just really just the way the, the light was. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you again for joining us and uh, showing us all your amazing work and and uh, definitely everybody if you haven't already go to his website and spend some time looking around there there's lots of amazing stuff so uh mark thank you i hope you can hope you'll come back and join us again sometime i'd love to thank you for having me all right well thanks everybody have a good evening <laughs>